Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode, I will talk about this. Um, I will not talk again about the LED clock. I did that in the previous episode by having the idea that I show time using LEDs, not where exactly the hand is, but as arc of circles to show the progress of time. And so this was in the last episode. Um, I did this for a friend and he gave it back to me because he said this is drifting over time. So every day he has to adjust the time. You can adjust the time over USB, but it, it's quite a pain. I've added a small button on the back to add one second, but this is also not good because you don't want to have a clock where you have to set the time always yourself. You have you want the clock to provide the time and it's not the other way around. So I've decided I have to extend it. And this was a plan which now is has taken place. This is the normal security, but what's new here is this small module. This is a DCF77 module. Like um, old times where you had churches or giant clock towers which would ring every hour using huge bells so you can keep track of time. Uh, in Germany, particularly in Germany, but all over Europe, you can receive a signal on the DC, on the 77.5 kilohertz frequency. And this provides time. Every minute it will say what time it is. And this is simply what this module in do is doing. So instead of setting the time by hand and correcting all the time, I'm using this this small module to receive the broadcaster time and to adjust the time all the time that is needed this way. Even if it drifts, I reset it to the right time because I received the time from a huge radio tower instead of a clock tower anymore. The wall clock is simply made by this piece of plastic with marks to show the hours and the minutes and this module here. And this is what, interest, what will interest us. So let's remove seconds, the minutes, the hours, front cover, and here's the inside. Let's have a, look, a closer look. When opening this clock module, I was surprised to see three epoxy blobs. The underneath of these epoxy blobs, you will find integrated circuits. And this is the chip on board technology. So you directly pack the chip on the board. You use wire bonding to connect it to the board. And then you put an epoxy blob to protect everything. This costs less than packaging the small integrated circuit into a cage and then having this package soldered on the board. But yeah, there are three of them. So this one is the biggest one. This is probably also the one responsible for keeping track of the time. Um, two clues. It's big. It's central, so you, you see all the wires go to this one. And then it has also this crystal, which is probably there to keep good track of the, of the time. Then we have the small one here. This one is responsible for the motors. You can see that there are two wires connected to the, sec, the second motor. And then there are two other wires which go along here all the way to here. And this is min, the min minutes motor. And on the other side, you can find the two motors for spinning the hands. And the last one here is the one responsible for receiving the DCF 77 signal. You, this is because you can see here there's the antenna for receiving the signal on 77.5 kilohertz. And you have also a small crystal because whenever you want to do some RF, you want to be precise and to have a precise way to be on the right frequency or listen to the right frequency, you generally have an external oscillator, which is this one here. But before we look at the radio part, which is the most relevant for our project, I wanted to use the opportunity to find out how actually this clock works. So I continued dismantling it and here I removed the back. And first we'll check this integrated circuit or this function. This is there to control the motor. So we have here the second motor and here we have here the motor responsible for moving on the minutes. And if we turn it around, slowly remove the cover. Yep. This is 
110. This is the simple circuit. So if I move on the second handle, you see it moves this one. So this motor, this these gears move the second, and the minute handle is this one, and we can see that this moves the minutes and the motor will correspond. So the motor are pretty simple. These are giant coils, probably and then we have some magnetic bars and this probably creates some magnetic momentum to to trigger these small gears here and we'll have a look at them. But it's an unusual thing. I haven't seen motors like this yet. So this is the simple motor and as we can see here we have two metal bars. One is nearer to the coil. Not sure how motor works, but what's funny is that here I've put a small mark and the motor only has two stable positions. No matter when I turn, it goes back to either this one or this position. So I think what it what this coil does is just send impulses so it moves the magnets or the, the this this part to one position or the other. If we take a look at it, and the back is just a magnet. If we now take magnet film to reveal the magnet fields, you see there are two north pole and two south pole. There are two part magnets, and I think this is also why there are two stables position. Instead of the battery, I'm using an external power supply to provide 1.5 volts to this clock. So these are the alligator clips here. And then we have channel 1 and channel 2, or channel actually channel 1 and channel 2, which are connected to both pins of the motor. And we can see that the motor is spinning thanks to the small mark here. So it's either this position or this position. And it spins all the way in, uh, in this direction. And I think they've set the metal bar or the magnets so uh, it moves only in one direction. That's quite clever. And now if we look at the oscilloscope on the pulses, we see on one pin we have this pulse, on the other pin you have the other pulse, and I think they just move to one or the other position, uh, depending on which pin is creating the pulse. Now, the next integrated circuit I was interested in is this one. This one is the central. It controls the motors, as we've seen. It decodes the demodulated data from this RF chip. So, this one just emulates the DCF77 signal and this one decodes what data is transported on the signal. It also keeps track of the time. This is why there is here this small oscillator. This is used for the internal real-time clock. But what it also does, it sets the time. So it decodes the time from the DCF signal and then it sets it on the minute and second hands. And for that, it needs to know where the minutes and seconds are pointing, so it can set actually the right time. And as we've seen on the back, they are just wheels, there's no rotary encoder, so I was interested to know how does it know where the seconds and the minutes are. And actually there's a nice little trick, so if we zoom a bit more, we see there are two diodes, D1 and here D2. I've sold also some wire, so we can see on the oscilloscope afterwards. But D1 is um, is an LED. So this is probably an infrared LED. I would guess infrared because it's the easiest one. And it shines through the body up and D2 is the other diode which goes up, which goes here. So this is D2 and here you can see this is to receive the infrared signals. So on one side we have the transmit, on the other side we have the receive. And if I turn the wheel, you see there's a small hole here. This is where the diodes go through and goes back. So it emits pulse, so it emits lights, and then it turns the wheel. And here we can see we have three different brackets, uh, three different tabs. So probably these two are two mount tabs, but this larger, larger one tells where the zero seconds is. So at the beginning, when it starts, it will just turn the wheel until this part blocks this path. So no pulse, infrared pulse, is going through. So it is blocked by this plastic part and not ca 
catched by this receiver and this way it knows okay I am on the minutes part so we'll have a look at it on the oscilloscope I've connected channel 1 the yellow orange channel to the LED which will emit the pills and then channel 2 the blue uh, channel is connected to the infrared receiver which is also a diode and we'll see the signals here so if I power it on the first thing that the clock will do is put the seconds to zero then it knows where the positions of the seconds are and then it just needs to count so here you can see that it turns around and then you will have pulses so you see here there's an LED pulse here we see the response so it means that the light goes through pulse response pulse response and you'll have to be a one minute so we can see some differences Here, here there's one pulse, but it didn't receive the signal back. This is where one of the tabs war it was. It is blocking the infrared signal, but it's just one second which is blocked. And I think this is just to mount to to verify uh, to to be able to have a solid piece, a solid circle. So we'll continue, and normally we'll see a second pulse here. Two third passed, we see the second one where there's a pulse, but there's no response. And then it continues until it finds the large tab, which will probably cover several pulses. So once this is up here, where the zero seconds is, we should see a clear response on the oscilloscope. See, pulse, no reaction, and this is for one, two, three and four tabs so the larger the larger tab which we saw is blocking the signal and then we have just one pulse more because we need the light to go through now we have the second sequence this is to figure out where the minutes are and for the minutes the mechanism is pretty similar we also have a motor here we have these wheels and if you remove this wheel we have this huge wheel here which is a bit longer and it's hard to see but this goes inside here and inside whoop, out of focus and inside you can see there's a second wheel so behind this wheel there's a, another one which can also block the signal and in the same way then to figure out where the seconds are or where the tab is there's a special special tab on this wheel which is there for the minutes and we'll have a look at the oscilloscope we saw the pattern for the seconds and for the minutes and the hours, it's the same thing. So this is the wheel for the seconds, this is the wheel for the minutes, this is the wheel for the hour. So we've seen already this pattern. There are two short ones supporting where there is only one tick which is not enabled and this one where four ticks are, are not passing through where they are blocked. And we can see that for the minutes, it's the same pattern. One tick which is blocked and four ticks which are blocked here. And then for the hours again, one tick is blocked and four ticks is blocked. And using the same algorithm, he, it just is able to figure out, the, to, to put the hands to the zero position. And because it knows where the zero position is and it knows how much to increment for the time, it can set the time. Well, it seems I won't be able to show you how it works with the minutes, but the principle is the same. There is a certain pattern which blocks infrared light and that in indicates that the minutes and the hours are at zero. And it takes quite a long time. Uh, I can show you because, as you can see, this motor is not spinning correctly anymore. So it doesn't manage to spin here. It only manages to spin one way, so at this position, but not the other one. And no matter what I do, I did manage to get it fixed. And seeing the price of that, I won't. I don't want to spend too much time. So because of that, I won't be able to show you the RF circuit with the um, RF pin and the P on. But it's not too much of a, pro of a problem because anyways, I couldn't use this one with the microcontroller, the, the one which is included here, simply because this works at 1.5 volts because of the battery here and I've tested it, the maximum it can operate is at 2.4 volts and my microcontroller works at 3.3 volts so I wouldn't be able to connect the output of this one to the microcontroller because of this 
uh, voltage difference, I could use um, level shifter, but that's one component more and I really don't care there's an, another solution. Also why I don't want to do this is simply because um, this is only powered on from time to time by this microcontroller. For example, at the beginning when the second, the minute and the hour are at zero, so it gets the right time. And if I fuss around and I want to enable whenever I want on my uh, on my microcontroller, then there is some kind of problem with this circuit and it doesn't work too well. So either way, I wouldn't be able to use this RF circuit and it seems that the thing here is done. But it was still interesting to figure out how it works and to see an example of an analog clock. I uh, have an alternative though, which I will show you. We have a casualty in line of duty, but rest assured, your sacrifice was not in vain. I will put the knowledge to good use and meanwhile, you can rest with the others in my electronic SIM tree. Bye bye. And meanwhile, I got the next target, this one. So uh, I couldn't use the older board because the voltage level were not right and the signal quality of the RF was actually really bad. So I picked the next cheapest one I could find. So this one is also a radio controlled clock, but it's digital and it has here the sign for radio control and I picked this one because it has two AAA batteries meaning that it should run with 3 volts and what runs with 3 volts generally runs with 3 or 3 volts so I can connect whatever is inside with a bit of luck to my microcontroller so I've opened the device and actually it is already salvaged so that's the inside there's nothing too fancy there's this time there's only one microcontroller which also um, has this connection to the LCD here, handles the buttons, and here what you don't see is actually I already removed the antenna. Yep. So this was simply sitting here, uh, and this was connected here. Now I've put a header instead of a sort of ribbon cable, and now I have a module. So this is... Um, DCF77 module which I can use on a microcontroller and the rest of it can go to the garbage. No ceremony for it. It didn't bring me anything except this one. Thanks for your organs. Here we have the DCF77 module and its task is really easy. In Germany there is a huge antenna broadcasting a signal all over Europe on the frequency 77.5 kHz. The antenna picks this low frequency signal and the IC which is on there, the small blob, again chip on board technology, which is a blob of epoxy, is just there to demulate the signal. Now the signal is simply amplitude modulated so and it has only two states, either high or low, so enabled or not enabled. And this module is just to decode there. Generally they come with four pins, VCC to provide power, ground for the reference, then we have an enable on low. This is the white lead you see here, which I connected to, to the ground. And then we have the output, which is now channel one of the oscilloscope. So the orange one, which you see here. And if I provide power, it is enabled on low. Needs a bit of time to tune. And here we can see already the, the signal of the, of the DCF77. And DCF77 is pretty easy. So here you can see that every second there is one sort of pulse and there are two states only if it's a short pulse so 100 milliseconds then it's a zero and if it's a long pulse 200 milliseconds then it's a one or the other way around i, I don't remember exactly but it's either zero one so 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds and this is broadcasted every second very precisely now to be to synchronize to the signal, you need some kind of pattern or something like that. So this is simple, is that at the end of every minute, so you have 60 bursts, one per second, and at the end of every minute, there will be no bursts. So whenever we will reach the end of the minute, we should see that we have no signal. So let's wait a bit. 
So these are still the bits within the minute. Which should not be long, maximum one minute. So we'll see if we receive it in one minute. Short, short. Sometimes we have small bursts. This is simply the AC decoding here. Here there is one pulse which is missing, one burst which is missing. This means that it's the end of the minute and the new frame starts and then we will have 60 bits, or actually 59 because the last bit is a, is not modulated. So we have 59 bits and each bit means something else and the encoding is, well, I took it straight from Wikipedia and it's pretty simple. It encodes the current date, the current time and so on and this is what I'm using now to get the, the current date and I'm using this pulse beginning to mark the beginning of the minute very precisely. Now let's connect to the microcontroller and see what it does. Here we have the setup. This is the development board. Again, it's based on the STM32 microcontroller just there. On the board we also have an embedded, so which I call internal um, real-time clock oscillator. This is the 32.768 kilohertz oscillator which is used for the real-time clock functionality of this microcontroller. And here we have the battery connected to the, to the board so that even if the microcontroller doesn't receive power from the USB port, the battery powers it, or at least it powers the real-time clock function. So it keeps oscillating and it keeps incrementing the time. So the real-time clock is still running. We also have the external real-time clock. This is the same module I uh, explained last time. It's just, this is the clock, there's the chip here, there's some EEPROM. Again, there is a battery on the back, so it can also keep track of time when there is no power. Here we have the connection, the ITC connection, and so I can talk to this dedicated chip DS17 or 1307. I've already presented it in the previous video. And what's new here is this module. And this is the DCF77 module we just salvaged from the radio clock with the antenna. And here, just USB to serial so I can debug it easily. This is um, a ST-Link 2 V2 clone, so I can flash the microcontroller using the serial debug. And here is just USB to power because, as you can see here, it is connected to the LED strip for the LED clock. And this needs 5 volt power, which is provided by the USB. The purpose now is that of this setup is to measure how accurate or how deviant these clocks are, uh, how, how much they drift per time. So the internal clock and the external clock. And for that I will use the clock information from this module because this is very precise. Um, here is just raw demodulation, but then I do the decoding on the microcontroller and every minute I know what time it is. And this way, every minute I can compare the time, how much time passed in the internal RTC and on the external RTC and see how much it drifted in this particularly over time. Because as I said, my friend reported that it drifted quite uh, every day he had to adjust by one or two seconds, so this is this is quite bad. And using this setup, I well, will just measure uh, how much it drifts and which one is better. Is the external RTC better or is the internal RTC good enough? So I've did that for a couple of time and let's see the results. Up to every minute I could get the time from the DCF77 signal and this is a quite precise time and I use this to measure the drift or the time which passed, the amount of time which passed in the internal and RT external RTC. In this way I could check what the drift is and this is what we see in this graphic. Um, it is quite long and I'll zoom into it. You see there are two arrows. The green one is for the external RTC and the red one is for the internal RTC. And on the x-axis we have the time. So I've measured this around four days long. There is one day which is gone here, but around four days long. And then the epsilon axis is the drift in percentage, meaning if one minute passed, then 0.01% more time passed in the, that's the external RTC and that's the internal RTC. 
The first thing you see is that there is some kind of offset. The internal RTC is um, almost on zero and the external RTC is not on zero. I don't think this is just because of the constant drift. I just think this is because of the code and because I need to read the time from the external RTC using I2C while the internal is just registers, it's super fast to read. And this is why I think there is this offset. So just ignore the, the offset. What is more important here are these spikes all the time. And you can see that the spikes are not too big. Too big. They are within 0.01%. And for that, I've calculated also the minimum percentage, the maximum, the mean. So here you can see that the external RTC has a higher mean. But again, this thing this is because of the code rather than because of the clock. And what's more important here is the standard deviation. And you can see that the internal and the external have almost the same standard deviation of 0 0.075 or 0 0.073 or 4%. So none is better. And I will use the internal because it's already on the board, so I don't need to, to use the external one. I will keep continuing using the internal because in the beginning I thought the internal one's not good enough. Now I have the standard deviation and I want to be, my goal is that it doesn't have a drift more than 250 milliseconds, so quarter second. If there's quarter second drift, it's for me the limit and it's almost visible. And if you calculate using the standard deviation, how much time has passed until there is this 250 milliseconds um, deviation, it's around 55 minutes. So what I will simply do is that every hour I will start the DCF77 signal until I get the new time. I set the time internally, I switch it off and then I use the internal oscillator. This way I save a bit of power and I keep the time very precise and updated. And this way no one has to set the time on the module again because it gets the right time all the time. And the battery which is connected to it will keep the time counting even if the module is not plugged over USB. Here we, on this terminal, I will show you the serial output of the microcontroller. Um, <coughs> you can either use the UART port, I prefer it because it's more reliable, but you can get the same output over USB because it provides the uh, ACM profile. So if I switch the microcontroller on, up, you see it starts, well, with the wel welcome message, then it sets up the internal RTC clock and not the external one. You can also use the external RTC clock, it's just one value to set in the source code and as always the source code will be available on Git. There is also some documentation, so it's not too hard to do it. Then there is this external DCF77 receiver or module. Um, Every time whenever the module is switched on, the microcontroller is switched on, it will always y try to get the time because y you never know what happens. Has the battery been disconnected or not? Um, we don't know. So this is why I switch on the thing in the beginning. Then the LEDs, these are the WS2812B LEDs. And this is just set up by that. The brightness sensor to, to set the brightness using a photo sensitive resistor. This is the crit time which has been saved. Um, because it's not 0, 0, 0, we know that the, it has been powered using an external battery. That's quite good already. And yeah, command input ready, we'll come to that. This is the time which is currently, so every minute it will show time. And as you see here, uh, after one minute, so this is it's switched on at this time, at when the minute was finished it showed this and then we need generally one minute to get the DCF77 signal. After one minute we've got the signal and we see that this is very close to here. This is when the internal RTC was at one minute. So here we got the time, now we have the date and the time. The date is not too important at least when we're using the internal RTC for the internal 
external RTC it will be set, but the time is important. So now the internal time has been updated, but it already matched quite well. If it did not match, you would see it displayed two times. And yeah, the DCF receiver is off, but you can change it. You, uh, it will be on every hour and we can cheat because this is the command input we have with two things. So we can either trigger the DCF by hand, but if I cheat with the time and I say it's zero one, let's say 59.45, this is the time. The time is set and normally when the hour is full, which should be in 15 seconds, then it will start the DCF 77. So let's see when the hour is full. Here the hour is full. Now we should have started this DCF 77. Ah, and it did. So we'll have to wait one minute. And after one minute, we should have like here received the time, updated the time. So let's wait one minute. So more than one minute passed simply because the DCF7 signal is sent every minute. So we have to wait until the new minute starts, but then it finally got the time after one minute and several seconds, it set the time. And now we again have the right time and then it switched off. And the next time it will update is at the next hour. And here is the new LED clock. So we have the microcontroller. We have here the connection to the RGB LEDs. Here we have the clock, the battery to keep the RTC running. This is the photoresistor to set the brightness of the LEDs. And here we have the DCF77 module. This is the addition to this new LED clock. And I've taped everything with polyamide tape. That's good enough. Nobody will see the cable because it's on the back. And since I broke the original analog or the clock with the hands here, he will not see anymore if actually this thing is drifting because the only time he will have is the time which I display on the LED and he cannot compare it to the time which is displayed on the hands. And this is quite disturbing if what is on the LED does not match which is on the hand. So that's good, a good side effect of having toned down a part of the clock. He will have to rely on my clock, which is precise enough. So yeah, the whole documentation is on the wiki again and enjoy.